You want to play as some intergalactic misfits? With Spelljammer being confirmed, which is a Dungeons & Dragons setting revolving around astral and intergalactic travel, what better way to do that than to make an entire party of characters recreating the Guardians of the Galaxy? And that's exactly what we're going to do because this is D&D Builds where we have an outlet to make all sorts of ridiculous Dungeons & Dragons builds and hopefully stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. We'll figure out a way to not just make the core members of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but some of the additions to the team as well. We won't go into excruciating detail or anything, so we won't be going level by level, Otherwise, this video would probably be about three hours long, but we'll make sure to cover all the important parts. Starting with the smallest member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, no, not Baby Groot, because he does grow up and become pretty much the biggest member, we're talking about Rocket. Rocket is definitely the tinkerer of the group, and although he was genetically modified to become Rocket Raccoon. I was tempted to go with Warforged as a race since they are created specifically for battle and war, but I think it's a little more fitting to go with a race that's a bit smaller and more raccoon-like. Similar to my Agretzko build, I think the closest we're gonna get is a Cobalt. Granted, we're gonna have to replace the scales with fur to get more of that trash panda look, but I think otherwise it's pretty spot on. We'll choose a background of Urban Bounty Hunter because that seems pretty spot on for most of what the Guardians of the Galaxy do, but especially for Rocket. And from this background, you also get two skills, and we're definitely gonna make sure we get Deception and Persuasion. That way you can convince others to give up mechanical body parts or eyes or whatever the hell you feel like collecting just as a joke. Top it off with a tool proficiency in Thieves tools, and you're pretty well covered when it comes to most of the skills. And since he's the tinkerer of the group, I think there's a very easy choice to go with as far as a class. Here you go. Oh, I was just kidding about the leg. I just need these two things. What? No, I, th I thought it'd be funny. Was it funny? No, wait, what did he look like hopping around? I had to transfer him 30,000 units. <laughs> You're gonna go Artificer. The Artificers are known as Tinkerers and you get to pick a subclass. And it's super easy because Rocket's always seen with a pretty massive gun or building one. So we're gonna choose the subclass Artillerist. As you level up with him and build him out, make sure to pump as many points into intelligence as possible and then follow it up with some dexterity as you can kind of nimbly dash around and hopefully not get hit. Then just focus on utilizing your Force Ballista that you get from being an Artificer Artillerist and blast away your enemies. Then the rest of this class focus on building infusion items or special mechanical inventions that you create. It's the best way to recreate Rocket and it helps most of your party. You're going to be the genius creating all the perfect gadgets for the perfect situations. Then we're going to go from the smallest member to one of the largest, going with Rocket's best buddy, Groot. While they haven't actually introduced Ents or tree people to D&D &D yet, at least as a playable character, which I really think they should since it's been in everything from Lord of the Rings onward. I think the easiest way we can recreate Groot using the existing playable characters would be picking a race that closely matches as much as possible. And I think that's probably going to be an Earth Ganassi. They tend to be more depicted as rock type people, but we can easily manipulate this to being a bit more tree-like. As you figure out where to allocate points for him, make sure you dump charisma because most people don't really know what he's saying and those that do tend to be dealing with his more angsty teen phase. So charisma is definitely going to be a dump stat. Otherwise, put everything you can into wisdom and constitution because it should be no surprise that we're going druid. He doesn't really transform into other creatures very often, so... I think we're best not focusing on Moon Druid or anything. There's really two types of Druid that seem to make sense. Circle of Spores, but that's more about releasing some poison into the air, so I think it's best we go with our second option, which is Circle of Land. You can choose a particular land that that Druid is focused on, and we're gonna pick the Forest. Circle of the Land Forest gives us Bark Skin, Plant Growth, and Tree Stride. Bark skin is going to be pretty awesome because that gives us that bark-like outer exterior that we get being Groot. And of course we have plant growth because you grow plants around you constantly. As you level up being a druid, make sure to grab a handful of spells that are all focused around something more Groot-like. Grab druid craft, which will really just coincide with your plant growth ability and help build up the forestry around you. Grab Thorn Whip to spread out your limbs and whip them across your enemies, and grab Shillelagh, because that way you can just 
beat people down with what's essentially your arms. As you continue to get more spells, make sure to grab Fairy Fire to reproduce that glowing lights thing that Groot managed to pull off, Good Berry to help out your teammates, and then some healing spells like Healing Word or maybe even Cure Wounds. And as you get even higher, grab Spike Growth, Wither and Bloom, Speak with Plants, Grasping Vine, Commune with Nature, Wall of Thorns, which is really going to be helpful, and then Druid Grove and Regenerate. Regenerate's going to be super helpful so that way you can chop off one of your own arms, use it for Shalele, and then be able to at least grow it back. And while Groot is one of the most lumbering members of the party, I think it's time we dive into the master of stealth, Drax. Oh, dude, how long have you been standing there? An hour. An hour? I've mastered the ability of standing so incredibly still that I've become invisible to the eye. Hi, Drax. Drax is working to avenge his lost family, and he has all those tattoos all over his body to help represent that loss. And while in the movies he's depicted as being a bit more gray, in the comics he's definitely more green. And with that mixed with his brooding nature, I think it's very easy to choose a race for him. We're gonna go half orc. Half orcs get bonuses to strength and constitution, and they're one of the best suited for the class we're gonna go with when it comes to Drax. A barbarian. Drax makes it very known that he has very sensitive nipples, and there's no way you can wear armor while having that sensitivity. Drax, why aren't you wearing one of Rocket's arrow rigs? It hurts. It hurts. I have sensitive nipples. <laughs> My nipples hurt, oh goodness! So you need a class with the ability of unarmored defense. Make sure to pump as many points into strength, constitution, and some dexterity to help boost up your armor class, and probably dump your charisma, wisdom, and intelligence because those definitely don't seem to be your forte. Drax has a tendency to attack non-stop with two short swords, so you're going to be dual wielding here. If you want to, you can try and grab the feet dual wielder and go with long swords, but they do tend to be closer to short swords. So if you're gonna grab a feat, I would grab the Fighter Initiate feat and grab the fighting style to weapon fighting. This will allow you to use your bonus action to attack with your off-handed short sword and still be able to get that bonus from your strength modifier to the damage. Mixing that with the additional damage you get from going into a rage and going wild, stabbing from wherever you are on the creature, you'll be able to get three attacks per round using your bonus action every time. And if you take your barbarian all the way to level 20, you'll be able to get 24 in strength, meaning that every attack has plus seven for your strength modifier and you can add in additional damage from your rage, getting an additional plus four for each one of those attacks. So that just means with all the three attacks landing, even before you roll any dice, you're getting 33 damage, which is pretty solid. When it comes to choosing a barbarian subclass, there's two schools of thought here. You could go very accurate to the movies, which is really just a berserker barbarian. The only issue with this is that it's not very well optimized and it kind of makes some of those features of being a Berserker go to waste. Frankly, Berserker is kind of one of the weaker Barbarian classes. Their main early level ability is called Frenzy. When you're in a rage, you can go into a Frenzy and it allows you an additional attack as a bonus action on each of your turns. But if you're already dual wielding, this is completely going to waste and Frenzy makes it so when you're done with your rage, you suffer a level of exhaustion and that is brutal to put up with as a player. It does have the feature at level 6 called Mindless Rage, which allows you to not be charmed or frightened while raging, which does seem very accurate to Drax, but overall I feel like a lot goes to waste with this build if you go with Berserker. It will be very true to the movies, but I have an alternative. Instead of being purely true to the movies, we could go more true to the spirit of Drax. Like I mentioned, he's covered in tattoos honoring his family that he lost thanks to Thanos. So we can really run with that theme and go with something that's a little more useful. We're gonna go Path of the Ancestral Guardian. 
This has features that allows you to rely on the spirits of your ancestors to help protect you and your friends. While it might be less accurate to the movies, I think it is very accurate in spirit. So if you want to make this full party and make sure that you're still very useful, I think this is what I'd go with. And now we're going to go from green in the comics to green in the movies going to Gamora. Gamora has been trained for battle her entire life by Thanos, but she was picked away from other members of her race at a young age. When it comes to choosing that race, I was kind of tempted to go with the race Verdan. It's another green type of race, and they're kind of an offshoot of Goblin, but they're usually depicted in a much more elegant way. The only issue is that a lot of their other features don't really coincide very well. Verdan have abilities revolving around telepathy, and that doesn't really seem to fit with Gamora at all. So instead, we're going to go half-orc again. While half-orcs do tend to be a bit more brutish, and that doesn't really feel quite right with Gamora, I think it's still going to be the closest we have. D&D has added the feature that if you want, you can change where the ability score points come from in their race. So instead of using points in strength and constitution from being a half orc, we can make an alteration here and it's still totally allowed by the rules in D&D and change our strength to dexterity. The only reason I make this change is because generally Gamora tends to fight in a much more nimble way, which doesn't feel like brute strength, despite the fact that she seems to be stronger than a few other members, including Peter Quill. As far as a background for Gamora, she's been trained for her life to be a soldier for Thanos. So I'm just going to grab the soldier background and keep on moving to the class. With her training and battle-tested ability, I would go with fighter for Gamora. Fighters are all about solid training and fundamentals and how to fight. They don't rely too heavily on technology. They just rely on their own abilities and really being able to go into battle. And with all the training that she got from Thanos, I think it only makes sense to go with a battle master. Battle masters get tons of maneuvers that they can use from their experiences in battle, including special techniques on ambushing enemies, evasive footwork, distracting people, or disarming your enemies or tripping your enemies. There's tons of maneuvers that you can choose to fit your playstyle, And I think the overall skill level that Gamora has fits perfectly with this build. Being a fighter, you also get the most attacks out of any class in D&D. By max level, you get four normal attacks and you have the ability to use action surge doubling it meaning you can truly be one of the most relentless attackers in the party now it's time to make our way from gamora over to the kind of leader if he can hang on to his spot of the guardians of the galaxy just so you know this is my ship still i'm in charge i know i know of course you are of course <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows who's in charge. Me. Right? Yes, you. Of course. Of course. Of course. Peter Quill, aka Star Lord. The race is actually slightly tricky here because although he was raised on Earth, he has something else inside of him. So we could go human or human variant, but I think a better choice is to lean into his background a little bit. And there's a reason he was able to hold on to an infinity stone and not immediately die, as that appears to be radiant or necrotic damage coursing through him. And his dad is a giant celestial body or a planet. So we're gonna go with a race that has that celestial blood going through it, and Osimar. Osimars have natural resistance to both radiant and necrotic damage, which makes sense for how you are able to deal with holding onto that infinity stone. And you have the ability to channel that celestial power through you, which usually correlates to some physical transformation. And it usually changes the colors of your eyes and gives you some additional power. We'll specifically go with a Scourge Osimar, as when you activate that power within you, this particular sub race mentions that searing light radiates from you pouring out of your eyes and mouth 
and threatens to actually char you from within. And that seems pretty fitting to what we see in the movies. Asamar also get bonuses to charisma and constitution, and considering how Star-Lord is depicted and how Chris Pratt is Chris Pratt, that charisma boost only makes sense. When it comes to a background for Star-Lord, I think we could also go with Urban Bounty Hunter like we did with Rocket, but we could also go with Criminal, as he does have quite the criminal past and he was essentially raised by rogues or intergalactic space thieves. Either one really works, but I think the bigger choice here is the class. And considering the singing and dancing and love for music that Star-Lord has, plus the overall charisma of the character, it's only fitting that we choose a bard. Bards are all about performance and charisma, and that's exactly what Star-Lord's all about. They get tons of spellcasting, and they can dip into some of the spellcasting of other classes, which is a nice feature to have. Star-Lord isn't afraid to jump headlong into battle, usually jumping around with his boots or using his blasters. So with that in mind, when picking a subclass, we need somebody with some battle ability, so we're going to pick up the Valor Bard. Valor Bards have additional access to weapons and armor, and they inspire others in combat. And that seems pretty accurate to what we see in the movies and Star-Lord's general abilities. Just make sure to pick up a handful of spells that really work well with Peter Quill, so really just grab things that boost your allies or debuff your enemies. But don't forget to grab Vicious Mockery to really insult your enemies and make it hurt a little bit. And grab one of the newer spells, Silvery Barbs, because this is all about distracting your enemies and you know how to do that. Finally, just to make sure you cover your bases with those rocket boot type things, make sure that Rocket Raccoon hooks you up with one of his artificer infusions and gives you the boots of striding and springing. And while that does cover the core members of the Guardians of the Galaxy, we can't just stop there because there's been plenty of other additions, starting with Gamora's sister from another mister, Nebula. Nebula has a very similar upbringing to Gamora, so there's gonna be a lot of similarities, but the biggest thing is gonna be the race. Every time Nebula failed, she was forced to be, quote, improved, leading to plenty of genetic and mechanical modifications to her body. With that in mind, instead of going half-orc or anything that might be a bluer type of race, we're going to go with Warforged. Warforged are just as much constructs as they are living, breathing creatures. They can be specialized in design, and they get plus one to their armor class just because they have harder, more resilient skin because they are forged for combat. And I think that fits very perfectly with Nebula. Since Nebula was brought up very similarly to Gamora, the background and class are going to be pretty much identical. She was also raised to be a soldier for Thanos, so we're going to grab this soldier background. And she's been trained in most of the arts of battle for her entire life. So we're going to grab the fighter and go battle master again. It's very similar, but if you want to be the point in the Guardians of the Galaxy timeline while well, Gamora is not around, but Nebula is, it's a nice little substitute in your party. And now, since the actress who portrays Nebula is great friends with this actress, we're going with the ever quirky and lovable Mantis. Mantis is definitely a very unique character to play as, and I think she'd be tons of fun to play in a D&D adventure. You get to do all sorts of weird, quirky stuff, and I'm sure it would create tons of interesting moments in a D&D campaign. But if you want to play as her, first thing we got to do is pick a race. While in the movies, she is a more neutral skin tone, in the comics, she's depicted as everything from that neutral tone to even more green. And we're going to lean into that and go with what we were considering for Gamora earlier, going a Verdon. Verdons have natural telepathic abilities, and that's definitely going to help us with recreating Mantis. Mantis is super charming, but she doesn't quite understand people very well, and she doesn't really rely too much on her own physical combat abilities. So we need a class that's going to reflect that really well, and I think the best way we can do that is by going Sorcerer. And right away with Sorcerer, you get to pick a subclass or a Sorceress Origin. And we're going to go with Aberrant Mind. Aberrant Mind is all about focusing on mental related powers. And that's pretty spot on for everything Mantis does. With how charming Mantis is, but not understanding people as a whole, we're just going to dump wisdom, but make sure we boost the hell out of charisma. And then follow it up with some dexterity and constitution, just to make sure you can survive a little easier. As you level up through this subclass, you get additional spells that are very relevant to more psychic related things. You get enhanced psychic defenses, 
giving you advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. You can cast most of your spells using psionic sorcery, meaning you can cast them telepathically instead of waving your arms around like the local wizard. And then a lot of the other abilities revolve around changing your physical form, which we're just kind of going to ignore for right now. When it comes to the spells, you automatically have access to dissonant whispers, mind sliver, calm emotions, detect thoughts, all of which feel like they fit super well with Mantis. The only other things I would make sure to grab at a low level is sleep because you tend to use that to help people to sleep. And then maybe at a higher level, grab that Cyanax Sorcery spell, Rary's Telepathic Bond. It should have you pretty well covered and you'll definitely be a fun member to add to the party. And now finally, we have one more member we have to include and that's Mary Poppins, y'all. Yondu likes to be the father figure, and he's not the daddy you have, he's the daddy you need. Picking a race is a little tricky, but I think we're gonna pick a nice, interesting blue alien race, even though many of the depictions are very similar to a different blue alien played by another member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. I think it fits pretty well with Yondu as well. And we're going Vidalkin. They get a boost to their intelligence and their wisdom, which I think works just fine. I would say the only thing that Yondu isn't great with is his charisma, and he's not quite as dim-witted as a lot of mercenaries and thieves seem to be throughout the galaxy, which I always find interesting because they have to have some ability to understand space travel, yet they're a complete idiot. But that's beside the point. When it comes to choosing a background, we're definitely going to go with the criminal background because he's definitely a hired criminal and that just seems to make the most sense. And then with him constantly looking for a good score, we're definitely going to grab the rogue class. As we level up, we want to grab a particular feat which will help us when it comes to recreating Yondu's ability to summon that arrow that can dash around at his command. So we're going to grab the feat telekinetic. This allows you to use the mage hand cantrip and make sure that that mage hand is invisible so you can move it around and hold on to that arrow without anybody actually knowing. And speaking of mage hand, when it comes to our subclass, when it comes to a rogue, we're going to choose arcane trickster. It's one of the only spell casting rogues you can get, but I think it's particularly fitting for Yondu. Being a thief while still having some unique abilities that are hard to replicate without some magic. But if you don't want to rely too heavily on magic, you could just go strictly thief rogue and just make sure you get something like a dancing rapier. While this isn't exactly the same as the arrow that Yondu has, its actual functionality is almost identical. The dancing rapier is a magical sword that as a bonus action, you can toss into the air and speak a command word or whistle. And when you do so, the sword begins to hover and flies around, moving up to 30 feet, and attacks one creature within five feet of the sword. This is almost identical to the functionality of the arrow that Yondu has, and you could say that the attunement that's required for the Dancing Rapier forces you to have that unique mohawk thing that Yondu has. So if you want to play as the true daddy of the Guardians of the Galaxy, I think this covers it pretty well. Go either Rogue Thief with a magical Dancing Rapier, or just stick with Arcane Trickster. And with that, we've covered most of the characters that have ever been a part of the Guardians of the Galaxy to some degree. So I think that if you're going to wind up in a Spelljammer themed campaign, you're pretty well covered if you want to go as the Guardians of the Galaxy. This entire build was created thanks to a vote that I posted on my YouTube. So if you don't want to miss out on stuff like that, make sure to subscribe. I post tons of D&D content, plenty of ridiculous builds, and occasionally throw up votes for what we should build next. So if you don't want to miss it, make sure to subscribe. If you want to go above and beyond like these amazingly kick-ass people, feel free to check out my Patreon and become a patron like these badasses because I really cannot thank them enough for all they do to help me with this channel. Finally, if there's additional builds that you want, let me know in the comments down below. I try and read as many of them as possible, and I'm gonna try and build everything I possibly can that's recommended. And lastly, if you made it all the way to the end here, let me know by hitting that like button. It lets me know you got all the way to the end of the video, and I'll be here helping you roll at least three nat 20s on your next D&D session, especially if you plan to dance battle your enemies into distraction as you soar through the galaxy, bringing about all sorts of mayhem and chaos.